of the entire day is that the risks of climate change are a lot higher when we account for permafrost and that people are being severely impacted now as a result of permafrost thaw. So this is, an, is not a problem of the future. Uh, Woodwell Climate Research Center is a research organization in Massachusetts and the United States on the land of the Wampanoag people. Uh, we conduct our research across the northern Arctic and boreal regions. Um, permafrost underlies much of these lands. The focus of this session is on climate impacts on permafrost, but I want to acknowledge that we recognize severe impacts of climate change on Arctic land and people and water, and that these climate changes are impacting and are interacting with ongoing human harms caused by colonization and extractivism. Um, as scientists, we continually aim to conduct our research in more equitable ways by valuing people, indigenous knowledge, and indigenous sovereignty. All right, so, sorry, I forgot to switch the slide. Um, so the Arctic has warmed three to four times faster than the rest of the planet. You can see that in this map, this very um, red area in northern regions. And each year in the Arctic, as with many other places, we're seeing a record breaking a record breaking a record. So the Arctic is already beyond two degrees Celsius warming. Um, as a result of that warming, the once frozen ground called permafrost is starting to thaw. So permafrost is ground is defined by its thermal state, so ground that's frozen for two or more consecutive years. Um, and that ground can contain any, any material, so it's essentially soil with a lot of organic carbon in it, often has a lot of ice, um, any of the material that's below zero degrees Celsius. Once it thaws, it's no longer permafrost. Um, when you have a lot of ice in the ground, as you can see in this example from the Peel Plateau in Canada, um, the ice turns to water and then the ground collapses. So this is a map of the permafrost region. Permafrost underlies about 15% of the northern hemisphere land area, but much of the permafrost will be lost in the coming decades. Um, here showing projected near surface permafrost near surface permafrost loss in 2100 under RCP 8.5. Um, and I just want to point out two things about this figure here. Um, so the projected loss in permafrost over the next century is about 25% to 70%. So that wide range is driven by the decisions that we make now. So this doesn't have to be the future of the Arctic. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that permafrost thaw is already underway. So this is this has been happening. Um, and as a result of that, um, communities are being severely impacted, as we heard from this last panel. Um, when permafrost thaws, you can have this catastrophic cat ground collapses, as you saw in that previous photo. Um, but you can also have more gradual thaws. Um, that maybe you're not seeing a collapsing hill slope, um, but this is impacting communities that are living uh, very close to sea level. Um, and as a result of this gradually sinking ground, these communities that are surrounded by water are losing more and more land. Um, this can have, at times, disastrous impacts on communities um, that are often living in very vulnerable environments. Uh, and this affects the permafrost thaws interacting with sea level rise and erosion. Um, you can see from this example, this airstrip here, many of the communities in the Arctic are not accessible by roads. Um, in this case, the only way in and out of this community is by this airstrip, which is really like just meters away from, from you know, being, being lost. Um, the other reason that we're here is because the global permafrost thaw. So permafrost stores about 1.5 or 1.4 to 1.6 trillion tons of carbon, so that's about twice the amount of carbon that's currently stored in the atmosphere. Um, there's very likely another trillion tons that's stored in deep sediment that's not considered in that first uh, more constrained uh, estimate, and also in subsea permafrost, which we'll be hearing more about. Um, this carbon is in the form of organic matter. Once that organic matter thaws, the microbes can break it down, releasing it to the atmosphere, uh, leading to more warming and more thaw. And so this is this positive feedback. Um, 
uh, we're coming across stock and need to more warning. Um, the big question is how much carbon will be released from permafrost? Um, how fast will that happen? Will it come out in the form of carbon dioxide and methane? And you'll be hearing more about that in the subsequent talks. Um, but I just want to say here is that um, carbon emissions from thawing permafrost by the end of this century will very likely be substantial. Um, there is a wide range of estimates right now, but even at the low end, um, carbon emissions are on par with some major fossil fuel emitting countries. On the high end of our scientific estimates, um, the emissions from permafrost thaw by the end of the century may be larger than emissions from the United States, uh, the lar second largest greenhouse gas emitting nation. Um, the other problem about this is that our current global climate policy isn't fully accounting for emissions from permafrost thaw, and as a result, the targets that we're setting now, our global carbon register remain below 2 degrees Celsius, are fundamentally inaccurate. They're accounting for some level of permafrost emissions, um, but they're not fully accounting for it. And just a quick review of, um, of permafrost um, in the IPCC 6th assessment report, um, what the IPC says, there's high confidence that warming will cause more permafrost thaw. Um, there's high confidence that thawing permafrost will lead to carbon release. Um, already some permafrost regions are a net source of carbon, so what that means is this northern region has been accumulating carbon for tens of thousands of years. Um, plants are taking it up from the atmosphere, storing it in the soil, being frozen in permafrost. There are some locations that are already starting to switch, so carbon dioxide and methane is being released to the atmosphere. Um, the IPCC says permafrost carbon losses are irreversible on centennial time scales, um, yet there still is a lot of uncertainty on the timing, form, and magnitude of emissions from permafrost thaw. Uh, there have been some advances in in permafrost science and its representation in the IPCC reports. Um, the last report, AR6, is the first time that permafrost carbon was included in IPCC models. So these are the Earth system models that are informing the science. Um, however, 82% of the IPCC Earth system models didn't even include permafrost carbon at all. The two models that did include permafrost carbon um, excluded some really important thaw processes, which you'll be hearing about in the next set of talks. The IPCC permafrost carbon budget reduction, and so there was an accounting for permafrost carbon in the last IPCC report, um, but it assumed a linear relationship between warming and permafrost thaw, as you'll hear more about in the coming talks. Um, we know that's not how the world is currently functioning and very unlikely to function into the future. And as a result, the current estimates that are in the IPCC report are very likely underestimates of the permafrost carbon feedback. And I will um, end there and just say thank you and we'll um, go to the next speaker, which will be Rachel Trahar. Gradually penetrating down into the ground, 
boring the permacross layer from the top down. And over time, essentially, you just have to go down deeper into the ground to be able to find that permafrost. I mean, this is the most, the most widespread and it's the most dominant process through which permafrost falls, but it's not the only process. Um, permafrost can also thaw abruptly, and this happens uh, most often in areas of the permafrost region where the ground contains a higher proportion of ice. Ah, oh, I have a little video, but I don't think it's going to work. But um, essentially, what it shows is that when the, uh, the ice within permafrost, ice rich permafrost melts, the ground loses volume. Um, so what this, this video would show, if, if it was playing, is that um, what we're looking at here is, is three different permafrost cores. And there is one um, on the left, which is pretty peaty and organic, but also contains um, a lot of ice. And as that one thaws out, what we see is basically that the, the volume of that core really decreases and actually by the end of this clip, um, which I know you can't see, but um, the whole volume of that core has kind of collapsed, it's completely lost its structural integrity, um, and basically it's gone from the height of that orange line on the left all the way down to the red line below that. Whereas the core on the, on the other side of the screen, this is one that contains very little ground ice. And you can see that again, um, throughout the clip as it, as it falls out, it goes from the orange line at the top down to the red line. You can see those lines are really close together. So essentially, you really see uh, much less of that loss of volume. And the same thing happens um, essentially at a landscape scale. So instead of that um, sort of slow, gradual, centimeter by centimeter, top-down thawing of the permafrost table, we see this uneven subsidence, this uneven collapse of the ground surface as the permafrost falls and the ice within that permafrost melts. Um, and this is an example of the kind of feature that we need um, in real life when we talk about a permafrost thaw. So more specifically, this is a retrogressive thaw slump. Um, and here, ice rich permafrost has thawed, and in this case, the result is that a slope here is destabilized and slumped. And you can see all this, this really dark ground here. This is exposed organic matter that once would have been protected by that intact permafrost, but is now vulnerable to undergoing decomposition, and therefore vulnerable to releasing that carbon that it has stored, perhaps for hundreds or thousands of years, back into the atmosphere. And what this place looks like, I mean, it, it is. It's a pretty dramatic landscape feature. But if we imagine kind of stepping back from this picture and thinking at a more um, regional scale, then these features are actually relatively small. But despite that, within this area they can expose, as you can see, a large amount of carbon comparatively quickly uh, compared to global core. So they can have um, sort of disproportionate to perhaps their spatial size um, a significant impact on emissions across the Arctic. So there's still something to be concerned about from the point of view of climate. And in fact, perhaps the biggest reason to be concerned about um, abrupt thaw is that these are not well represented in climate models. And we heard um, I think Sue that few climate models are being very purposeful at all. Um, and by that we mean that very few models incorporate random purposeful. In fact, no climate models include abrupt permafrost thaw. This is something that is just not accounted for. So, so why, why is that? Um, there's a few reasons for this. Um, one of the big ones is that we actually don't have a pan-arctic assessment of abrupt thaw occurrence. So we don't know how much abrupt thaw is increasing in response to warming. Uh, we can be pretty confident and increasingly confident as new studies are coming out all of the time that warming is driving an increase in abrupt thaw incidents in many regions, even uh, some work suggested in the high Arctic um, already. But we don't have a clear picture of the rates of that increase. I mean, this, this is a pretty big challenge to overcome, again, because partly because these features are pretty small. Um, and in contrast, we're talking about the Arctic, the permafrost region, a huge region, much of which is remote and challenging expensive to access. The result of that is that on the ground monitoring across the Arctic is, is pretty sparse. So this map um, is actually is just showing monitoring stations across the Arctic that are recording both carbon dioxide and methane emissions throughout the year. So it's not all of the monitoring happening across the Arctic, 
Um, but it does give you a picture of when we focus on a specific question, how sparse that data collection is and how huge the gaps are when we don't have a really detailed picture of what is going on. And in the case of Rock 4, overcoming this becomes even a little bit harder because in comparison, for example, something like fire, where we can imagine there's that clear kind of thermal signature that we can use to find these things, a Rock 4 doesn't have a kind of a clear signal that it produces that we can identify remotely. So right now, being able to map a Rock 4 across the Arctic is a really major priority um, for climate force science. And one really exciting approach to, to this challenge is, is being led by um, a colleague of mine, uh, Goodwell Yi Yang, who's working um, with, with Sue and also with Brendan, who's going to um, speak shortly al alongside others. And it's very kindly um, allowed us to tell you a little bit about, about this piece of work. So this is using um, a deep neural network model to map uh, one type of rut thaw. And actually, that type is those retrogressive force lumps that we talked about earlier. And this is, this is really brand new work. I mean, it's not published, um, and I can't pretend to be able to tell you um, very much about uh, deep neural networks. Um, perhaps that's something that, that others can later, but I did want to give you a little preview of some of the results um, that will ultimately be, be published um, in this manuscript. So in all of these images that you're looking at here, there's, there's two panels. The right-hand panel is showing a prediction which has been made by this new neural network model. Um, so a prediction of where a retrogressive, where, where it thinks a retrogressive force lump is, uh, with that prediction shaded in red. And on the left um, of each panel, there's a reality check in the same area, so any confirmed retrogressive force lump being outlined in green. And the takeaway here is that you can see it's doing, it's doing a pretty great job. Um, you can see the same features that are outlined in green on the left being picked up um, in the red shaded predictions of the model on the right. Um, it's not perfect. Looking at the pair of images um, on the right hand side, the little tiny green outlined feature at the bottom of the, the water body you can see there, which it has missed. But overall, this is performing really well. This is a really exciting um, development. And I would say, yeah, in my, in my opinion, I'm really excited about this. And um, I just wanted to give this a little taster of the kind of the real cutting edge work that is pushing forwards um, our understanding of what is happening in the, in the Arctic. So I sort of watch this space. At the same time, um, um, I and, and others in the community are kind of conscious that as well as pushing forward this, this real kind of precise, quantified understanding of exactly what it is that we're seeing in response to climate change across the Arctic, we need to be making sure that we're also kind of communicating and looking at the, the possible or the likely implications of the information that we do have, um, and that of course applies to a rough four as much as to everything else. So this leads on um, a little bit to some of my own work, which is focused on integrating the existing knowledge that we do have, the existing work that has been done um, regarding abrupt core and other processes, into this sort of simplified, pretty nimble climate model that we can look, um, use to look at um, questions related to global climate policy. Um, in the case of a rough board, my work with this model is building um, on this 2020 paper led by uh, Merit Tresky. And this is um, basically overcomes some of the challenges I've talked about by assuming that the rate of increase in a rut ball will track that of gradual fall. Um, so using that assumption to enable a pan-arctic prediction, in fact the first pan-arctic prediction of future carbon emissions from a rut ball. So having built this approach um, into, into our own model, we've been looking at the impact, um, what the impact of accounting for a rut floor in this way has on carbon budgets associated with particular temperature targets. So what we're looking at here is um, an example of the reduction that we see in those carbon budgets. Um, so on the left here you can see um, the reduction in the, um, the carbon budgets for one and a half degrees and on the right for two degrees. And the bar on the left is showing that with respect to gradual carbon cross thaw only. And the bar on the right is showing the increase in that reduction when you add in a rough four. You can see in both cases it's a pretty substantial change in the size of that bar. And actually looking at the two degree target, that increase um, alone, we're looking at something that exceeds the um, emissions, global anthropogenic emissions for an entire year. So just for an idea of scale, we're talking about something pretty considerable. And 
I also wanted to highlight, um, particularly when we're talking about Prop 4, that it's not just the total amount of carbon. Um, we also have to consider other aspects, like the fact that for Prop 4, we often see a higher proportion of emissions being released as methane. So this is not a pre figure, it's just um, more of a sort of technical one from, from the work we're doing. But what this is showing right now is um, the proportion from a little subset of models um, of carbon that is released from gradual bore as methane. You can see it's a pretty small amount of that carbon that's coming out of methane. Um, and this is the comparison for a graph bore, which comes out around 20%. So you can imagine this does have a substantial um, consequence. Um, one final point I just want to highlight, and it's something that uh, will be talked about a little bit more later on, is that um, as with the Prop 4, we sort of we can't uh, just treat this as, as one issue to build into uh, a model and then leave it alone. It also interacts with other processes, and particularly fire. Um, and I think just this image sort of shows quite intuitively why we have to consider fire and permafrost all together. You can see this is a burned area, and you can just imagine the removal of the vegetation here, the darkening of the ground surface really changes how much heat is going into the ground and you can imagine that having real consequences for permafrost thaw and including abrupt thaw. And there is a lot of work going on in this field at the moment. I wanted to highlight um, a finding just from one paper, this is just one example, which found that fire has a really substantial impact um, on particular types of abrupt thaw that we see happening um, in, in the region focused on here, which was Alaska. So, just a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, just to highlight a few final points. I think the key takeaways here um, are that we are, um, we can be increasingly confident we're seeing an increase in the incidence of rock thaw across the Arctic. And one of the core reasons to concern about this is the underrepresentation of this process alongside other processes in climate models. Um, and work so far indicates that the implications of that are substantial. We do see when we try, when we make attempts to account for that, we see substantial consequences for our predictions in the future. And that, um, thank, you, uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm very happy to take questions later on, and I'll hand over to our next speaker, who um, I think is Brendan. session uh, and just building on what um, Sue and Rachel have talked about I'm gonna talk about another process that is very important in permafrost zones but is also not included um, in the models and that needs to change and so I'm gonna be giving some updates about fires um, across the permafrost zone um, looking at patterns trends and implications um, I'm a scientist at Woodhull Climate Research Center which is uh, on the land of the Wampanoag people so I'm going to just start with some basics about fire. So fire globally can essentially occur in any terrestrial ecosystem, uh, but we see that it mostly occurs in areas of intermediate moisture. So on the left side of this moisture curve, we have systems that we call fuel limited, or they don't have enough fuel to, for the fire to spread across the landscape. And then we have systems on the right, like the Arctic, that are generally aridity limited, meaning that they have fuel, they have vegetation, they have organic matter that can burn, uh, but it's often too wet to burn. And then of course, we need an ignition source. So humans ignite a lot of fires globally, but in the Arctic and from across regions, lightning is, uh, is one of the, is the biggest factor in terms of uh, the fires that burn most area. So we need an ignition source. We do get those two things in the Arctic uh, quite a lot. So this is a map of cumulative burned area across the Arctic boreal zone, um, pretty equivalent to the permafrost zone for a 20 year period. And essentially any non-mountainous region can burn at some point. So fires are an important part of the ecosystem. It's good to know that fire inherently is not a bad thing. These systems are adapted to fire, but what's happening now you know, with climate change is that we're seeing dramatic warming. Oh no, another video that won't play. <laughs> this one's less complex, but I love this video. I'm sorry that it won't play. 
um, but good lesson learned. So essentially what it would show if it was playing was the time series of temperatures across the globe, and as you might imagine, as it progresses on and gets close to present day, um, the Arctic uh, balloons up as this big, big, big red blob. Uh, the Arctic, uh, the current assessment, the last assessment I've seen is that the Arctic is warming about four times as fast as the rest of the planet, so that is very, very rapid. And what that's doing in terms of fire, it's lengthening the fire season, so there's more time for fires to burn. It's resulting in more extreme fire weather, um, and so, and it's also resulting in more lightning ignitions. So we are very much seeing intensifying fire regimes at northern latitudes. I feel like I give a talk such as this uh, frequently, and my job is easy in the sense of updating from the last extreme fire season because it seems like almost any year is an extreme fire season in one way or the other in high latitudes. This year is no exception. What I'm going to highlight here for Alaska and Canada is how the lengthening of the fire season has been taking place. So this is a picture of the Queefluk fire that occurred in southwest Alaska in April. Uh, it's the largest fire in April in Alaska in 25 years, and it's virtually unheard of to have this kind of fire in April in the tundra. So this is really, really quite an anomaly. So the fire season started in April in Alaska. It was actually a very large fire season. It was followed by lots and lots of lightning, especially in July. But the fire season only just ended a few weeks ago. So in Canada, this is a picture of the Scotty Creek Research Station, which has been around for almost 30 years, applying lots and lots of great data one of the first indigenous-led research stations in the world, um, and the fire came through and essentially destroyed all of the equipment. So our team is working to re-instrument uh, the site currently. Looking towards Siberia, Siberia has ex uh, experienced some really extreme fire seasons in 2019, in 2020, and in 2021. So this is a map, this paper came out in Science just last week looking at fires north of the Arctic Circle. All of those black areas are places that burned in the 18-year period, 2001 to 2018. And just in the two years, 2019 and 2020, you can see what burned, uh, especially in north of the Arctic Circle in Siberia. Here's another paper that also came out at the same time, just a different way of looking at it, the Siberian tundra. Uh, sort of cumulative burning over the course of the season, and everything in gray is that 18-year period, and it's the last uh, three years there uh, in red and orange. So we're seeing a northward migration of fires into the tundra that um, really, those, those, those systems do experience fire, but usually like they're not very frequent. They something hundreds or thousands of years, and we're seeing that happening quicker and quicker and quicker. And we do expect continued increases in burning with climate warming. Um, oh good, so this, this video works. Uh, so this is um, a map made by a colleague of ours at Woodwell, Greg Fisk, and what it's doing is it's representing um, projected warming across the earth by mid-century as topography. So the red mountains that you see in the Arctic and the Antarctic are just representing how quickly that region is warming compared to the rest of the world. Where we have good long-term data. All things seem to change. Oh, no, no, hold on, sorry. I can talk you through it if it's not going to play. But where we have good long-term data, we're seeing, and this is in Alaska and Canada, we're seeing about a doubling of burned area over the last 60 years. Oh wow, my PowerPoint really, really did a number of <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to just try to get past this so I can continue the presentation. Okay, great, let's move on. So the point is that it's been warming, it will continue to warm, and this is driving increases in fires. So I want to talk about the impacts of fires on carbon, building on both Sue um, and Rachel's talks. So um, again, wildfires are not a bad thing inherently, but we're seeing an intensification of the fire regime in lots of different ways. So fires can emit carbon in a few different ways. One of those is just directly the emissions that they, um, they produce at the time of burning. So most of the carbon that gets emitted to the atmosphere from fires and from across regions comes from the ground. So this is a picture of right after a fire in a black spruce forest in interior Alaska. And all of that soil organic matter or duff that you see missing is now in the air. So most of the emissions are coming from the soils themselves. However, and I apologize, I don't have a great picture of this, but what fires also do is they remove the organic matter so that insulates the permafrost. So the permafrost can then start to thaw. 
So we see deeper thaw depth and deeper active layer thicknesses in, in, in ecosystems after fire. So this is a graph of that, looking at different studies, but that increase in the active layer going from maybe a few centimeters up to uh, almost three and a half meters, when that occurs, that soil is then exposed to microbes that can decompose and emit both CO2 and methane. And as Rachel alluded to, in places with excess ground ice, fires can initiate thermocars. So they subside, uh, that ground ice melts, and that can lead to abrupt thaw processes that then re release further carbon. So I'm just briefly talk through these, deep, these three different ways in which fires emit carbon, what we know, um, and how that's impacting climate. So I would say we have the most information on direct emissions. It's perhaps the easiest thing to actually study. So myself and colleagues, uh, both in Europe and Russia, have been building these databases of combustion measurements across the permafrost zone. And here you, you see a compilation of that for North America and Eurasia. The one thing I would note is the numbers. So we have many, many, many more observations in North America than we do Eurasia. So we need more observations, especially in Siberia. But we can take those observations, we can combine that with remote sensing, different types of modeling to get estimates of the amount of carbon um, leaving these systems through fire. We don't have the type of uh, data that we need in Siberia, but we can build our observations into global models, and this is just the latest example of that, where we see a time series of carbon emissions from fire across the high latitude zone. First of all, just note the scale. These are this is a pretty high level of emissions. We're talking you know, up to 500 teragrams or half of a petagram per year. Um, and the other thing to note here, it's 20 years is too short to really look at a, a trend. Um, uh, we, we probably need at least 20 or 30 years for fire trends. But one thing is that um, we tend to get, when we have large fire seasons in Eurasia, they tend to be um, low fire seasons in North America and vice versa, just the way that the climate system works. Looking towards the future, we don't exactly know what climate trajectory we're going to head on. I very much and we very much hope it's on the low end. What we can do, though, is look at all the studies out there that um, are projecting fire uh, regimes and look at how that changes as a function of temperature. So this is work that we've compiled for some work that Rachel is doing. And you know the dots are a little bit all over the place uh, because they're using different methods, and different studies, different regions. But look at the scale. So this is change in burned area, and you see dots well above the 250% uh, percent mark. So we're, we're expecting continued intensifications of these fires um, potentially um, to large magnitudes. In North America, where we do have really good data, we can combine that with uh, observations going back to roughly the 1960s and look at what we expect to be coming out um, from permafrost regions. This is Alaska and Canada uh, from wildfires. And that's what you see is that, that sort of pink bar going into the future. This is showing gross emissions, so not accounting for ecosystem regrowth. Even if we build an ecosystem regrowth, and I should also note this is CO2, it's not methane or other greenhouse gases that are um, that are emitted, and it's also not accounting for permafrost. But the, the emissions are of the scale uh, that's globally important. So within that pink bar on the right, for example, uh, are the annual emissions from California. California, if it were its own country, would be about the fifth largest economy. So the emissions coming from these systems, even if you account for ecosystem regrowth, are globally significant. Also as part of this work, we quantified how effective fire suppression is at limiting these emissions. It actually winds up being pretty cost effective in terms of keeping carbon in the ground. And then moving towards the impacts of fire on permafrost. This again is some of Rachel's work. I just want to highlight what's in the IPCC now that both Sue and Rachel talked about and what our models and observations are actually showing. So this is looking at the feedback in terms of gigaton CO2 per degree of warming. I should have a no tweet sign on this. I didn't <laughs> realize to do that. Um, but this is work in progress, so it's not published yet. Uh, so on the, on the bottom left is the IPCC estimate of the feedback from permafrost in terms of remaining carbon budgets uh, for humans to emit to stay within um, you know, one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Uh, from the models that we're using uh, in the middle, looking at just gradual thaw, it's about uh, double what the IPCC estimate. And I would say it's not just our models. Across the permafrost carbon community, it's pretty well known that what's in the IPCC now is very much on the low end. It's very conservative. But then when we build in what's labeled total feedback, this is both abrupt thaw that Rachel talked about and fire, we again get a doubling. So now we're looking at 300 or even more uh, gigatons of CO2 per degree of, of, of warming. So these are very, very globally significant numbers. And this is a more complex version graph of what Rachel just showed. 
So nonetheless, looking at the one and a half degree scenario on the left, two degrees on the right, and just to note the scale at which these emissions are projected to be coming out from gradual thaw, abrupt thaw, and then if you add in the fire processes, so direct emissions and then fire mediated thaw. And to be frank, we also expect this number to grow because these are exceedance budgets, uh, but we really need to be calculating our avoidance budgets, and those are different trajectories, and we expect them across to be emitting more in those scenarios. So um, my conclusions, I think, you know, from a scientific perspective, certainly uh, there are important science questions that remain. Nevertheless, we do know a lot. We know that fire activity in permafrost regions is intensifying and will continue to do so. Um, we know that um, fire and fire-induced uh, permafrost thaw impacts global carbon budgets, that information is essentially not included in current estimates now. Um, and we, so as a result, we have some policy recommendations, uh, including um, you know, including, including those emerging fire permafrost estimates into global carbon budgets, um, accelerating the ambition of NDCs, and I also think this offers us a chance to rethink how we do fire management, including restoring indigenous rights for cultural burning practices, indigenous peoples that maintain these uh, fire practices for millennia and are knowledge holders of deep uh, fire knowledge or largely ignored in Western management agencies, um, but also thinking about carbon and permafrost vulnerability as a potential metric for fire management and fire suppression. So, thank you. Yeah, please, if there are any questions, we can, we can pause. Oh, yes, please. Do um, you have a microphone? To Biomass burning aerosols uh, that result from wildfires. So I'm really interested um, in your talk, particularly um, when considering um, carbon emissions. Um, how much of that is um, carbon dioxide versus other forms of carbon, like particulate, um, organic uh, aerosols, and black carbon from the home? Yeah, so there are some pretty good estimates out there. Um, I would I would say though that um, they, they, they tend to be biased by aircraft observation, which don't necessarily, um, for example, they're not getting the nighttime burning, which we have a lot of smoldering and more methane coming out. We do have some work where we're looking at the radiative forcing of all the greenhouse gases, and I can say, you know, to a first degree, the warning from these fires, about half of it is coming from CO2, and about half of it is coming from all the other greenhouse gases. So it's not just methane, but it's precursors to ozone, and 2 o et cetera. Um, aerosols is a really tricky one. I, it's not my expertise. Um, from what I understand, of course, there's both black carbon, um, uh, so the guinea carbon that affects the atmosphere, direct absorption, and can get deposited on, 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 on ice and snow, but it can also result in cooling from you know, increasing cloud, cloud nuclei. The, the estimates vary, but those, I guess that's one thing that I would like to, to push when understanding the, thinking about those forcings, is that the aerosol forcings um, they essentially go away within a few weeks, whereas the greenhouse gas forcings, albedo, they last for a very, very, very long time. And the greenhouse gases are also globally mixed. So you kind of have to think about these in different ways, um, but it's also very important for, of course, understanding the effects of fire on the climate. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you. And uh, the next speaker will be Gustav Mugelius. Talking about uh, subsea permafrost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll, we'll be switching topic or switching domain to the subsea permafrost domain. Uh, so I'm Gustav Gebe from Stockholm University. I'm the Bodin Center for Climate Research in Stockholm. Uh, but I'm actually here presenting work on behalf of Paul Oberdu from the Alfred Wegener Institute. So I'm I'm not really, I'm not a subsea permafrost specialist by far, but I'm going to do my best in presenting Paul's work, a lot of which comes out of, uh, of, a, of an ongoing EU project called Lunatario, which focuses on this, on sort of the, this domain on the border between the terrestrial and the subsea permafrost domain. So, the subsea permafrost, 
essentially acts both as a lid and freezer on a massive amount of organic material and hydrates that are stored in the substance system. Uh, I'm going to come back to try to sort of tease these this aspects out a little bit, but it's really doing a, a dual service here. It's keeping already gaseous, uh, especially methane, trapped in the seabed, but it's also freeze locking a lot of organic carbon that is frozen in the sediment reserves. So it's acting as a lot as a lid and as a freeze. We get back to that later. Uh, so the sort of outline of this presentation, if we want to turn the trees apart, what are the climate risks associated with substance carbon? Is there a risk for immediate catastrophic methane release, as some past papers have at least alluded to? Or are we more looking at a sustained long-term greenhouse gas emission risk? And the sort of second part uh, of, the, of this presentation, we want to take apart, what do we know? This is in a very data-limited area in general. Uh, compared to the terrestrial profile, so there is a, a factor 10 less observational data, and it's quite hard to study the subsea profile in general. So uncertainties are large, but there's also a lot of progress being made in a lot of new knowledge coming out. So we're going to look at how much methane and organic carbon lie in the Arctic seas, roughly. Uh, can this reach the atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases? And if so, when would that happen? So we're going to start with a map of the whole permafrost, the whole northern permafrost system, I should say. Here you see the terrestrial permafrost system in orange, different colors, sort of shades, showing different coverage of permafrost, and so it's sporadic, isolated. And in green, bluish tones, you see the subsea permafrost system, which is essentially limited to the, the Arctic shelf seas, the areas where the Arctic Ocean are really shallow. And this coincides with areas where during the last ice age and preceding ice ages, when the water level was a lot lower, because a lot, a lot of the water was tied up in ice sheets, the whole sea level was lower, and this subsea permafrost areas that are now under the sea were at that time actually exposed to the air. So these are old terrestrial ecosystems that were flooded as the, as, as the ice age melted during the last glaciation roughly 20,000 years ago and onwards. So we're really studying past terrestrial systems that have been submerged again by the water and there's this sort of complex uh, dynamic going on that we need to understand. Uh, I can you also note that the, 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 the size is roughly a tenth of the terrestrial subsea system, but it still holds a lot of carbon, which still makes it quite important. So if we zoom in on one sort of part of this system and look at a, at a gradient from land to sea, uh, this is from the Canadian Beaufort Sea Coast. Uh, here you see the cross section across the uh, subsea permafrost system. You have the, the permafrost uh, is in a blue shaded area which overlaps with the red area that is the zone where gas hydrates are stable. And you see this zone exists both in the, in the seafloor beneath, beneath the permafrost, in the permafrost, but also exists on the really steep slope that goes out into the deep part of the ocean. So I'm going to get back to what ga gas hydrates are. But this is, this is the system that we're studying. And it's actually flowing both from above and from below. The warm sea water is flowing from above, but also often geothermally from the from the Earth's center is also following it from below. So what are the potential greenhouse gas sources from this system? Uh, the first one is the same as we see on land, organic carbon. Old plant and animal remains that are frozen in the permafrost right now. Uh, and we find a lot of this wherever sediments or soils get deposited and grow. And in the, ocean, in the oceans you have both the old terrestrial soils that have been flooded, but you also have sediments that are just sedimenting in us in any oceanic system. So actually this, this organic carbon in the subsea permafrost is like a sandwich with terrestrial soils, then, then the marine sediment and then terrestrial soils again, and this have added up for a really long time. Uh, and this is, this, as if this thaws, microbes start to decompose it, which as a byproduct of their metabolism they produce greenhouse gases. The other source of potential greenhouse gases that we find in the system are the gas hydrates. The gas hydrates are found both within the permafrost, underneath the permafrost, and in the marine system because of high pressures. So there are little bits everywhere in the system. Uh, and if they melt or dissociate, they will become greenhouse gases directly. So gas hydrates basically, they look like ice. So they are gas that is frozen into water, 
and they remain stable when they are either cold or under really high pressure. So that's why we have these different zones where they can be stable both in the permafrost, at greater depth, at the shelf, etc. And these are really, these are like concentrated methane bonds. So one liter of hydrate equals more than 160 liters of methane as it is associated. Uh, and now I'm getting back to this, this concept of a kotlin and the freezer. So this is a complex graph that shows you a lot of different things going on at once. You have the permafrost zone as a sort of dark blue, and then you see in the red and yellow and orange colors, you have either free methane uh, that's coming also from thermogenic sources, so basically natural gas. You have the, you have the hydrates, and, uh, and you see how the, how the permafrost is acting as a lid, keeping a lot of this trapped in the, in the seabed. Uh, and then you also, it's also acting as a freezer at the same time for the most amount of organic carbon that are in that system. Uh, you also see all of the process going on on land that we heard about earlier with different land forms up on land. But all of this together forms like the full permafrost carbon feedback loop where you can have both the terrestrial system and the marine system reducing both CO2 and methane as, as warming progresses. So basically we have the pot on the lid and what the warming is doing is cracking the lid and unplugging the freezer. And it seems like this, this is actually happening faster than what a lot of models had, had projected for, for the subsea system. Uh, and uh, more and more observational data is emerging. This is a very nice example of, of, of sort of collaborative work in, in, in the Nulatarian project where the researchers from Stockholm University have put together Circumarctic sediment carbon database. This is really the first openly available database that shows how much organic carbon is in subsea permafrost or in these sediments. So a lot of this data has or was proprietary, you know, we're all oil companies, a lot of the data that still exists is often in the hands of oil companies rather than you know, other private entities. But they, they managed to put together a wealth of data, mainly with a lot of the Russian sources coming into this database. And it's openly available for anyone to download and use. Um, so using this data coupled to long-term models, uh, researchers are you know, trying to figure out roughly how much carbon can have accumulated if you go to really deep down in the sediments. And the results are that roughly 3,000 petrograms, 3,000 billion tons of organic carbon has accumulated over a really long time period. So over 450,000 years when you have repeated ice ages uh, accumulating carbon in the system. And that's roughly a double the amount of organic carbon that's on that. Now, not all of this is going gonna, is gonna to flux into, into the atmosphere, of course, but even if a fraction of it does, it's quite serious. Uh, another paper that came out very recently that you know, takes advantage of the, 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 the new data becoming available has used a lot of deep sediment cores together with this Cascade database. They found that the rapid ongoing annual thaw in the, in the system actually exposes more than one kilo of carbon per square meter a year to, to decomposition. That's between five and ten times more rapid than what we see on land if you have if, if you account for, for, for gradual thaw. If you look at the rough thaw, it's similar. Uh, so, so this is also concerning when it comes to the potential future rates of relief. Uh, and then when it comes to the source of gas hydrates. So I, I just showed you figures for the organic carbon the sediments, but the gas hydrates remain really poorly quantified. So basically we don't really know how much there is. An estimate is around 20, around 20 pentagrams of carbon in this in this region uh, from Rapel in 2015, but it's not known how much methane is free gas. Estimates of current emissions range from from uh, from hydrate range between zero and 17 terabytes of methane per year, a really wide range. For reference, the current growth rate of, of methane in the atmosphere globally is roughly 17 terabytes per year. So the whole growth rate of the whole uh, sort of methane budget is on par with the highest range of estimates here. And it's believed that 17 terabytes for methane alone is probably an outlier, not really what we're seeing today. It's probably closer to one or two. But there is, with that said, there is a lot of evidence for, for methane emissions, observational evidence of seabed features like the sort of blue, sort of 
sort of potholes in the seabed and bubble plumes that we see that are associated together with this, either from, uh, from, from bubbles accumulating from hybrids or from the decomposition of organic sediments, or quite often actually from geogenic sources, so natural gas seeps that are bubbling up. As the, uh, as the purpose of thawing, more and more natural gas can reach the atmosphere in the form of bubbles. So then the question is how quickly might this happen? Uh, permafrost thaw is needed, and then in that case, permafrost thaw will release, will make organic carbon available for the decomposition. And then the question is how much of that can come out of methane, how much of the free gas and hydrates can, can be emitted to the surface. This is a really complicated problem because most of the methane that is formed in the seabed is actually not reaching the atmosphere. A lot of it is oxidized in the, in the sediments or oxidized in the water column or not just reaching the atmosphere and sometimes it stays in the ocean. Uh, I think there's a general consensus that the sort of methane bomb really rapid emissions that have been alluded to in early literature, there's no evidence of that and it's unlikely that that is something that's going to happen on very short time scales. With that said, this is still a very serious issue for longer time scales. Um, this is the recent modeling work on subsea permafrost thaw. One of the first couple of models to really be able to include subsea permafrost thaw uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, and what you see here are the sort of what's called the rocky road, this uh, RCP 8.5, and then you have Midland Road, RCP 4.5, and the green road or the blue road, or the other one, RCP 2.6. Uh, and you see there's a massive difference in the thaw rate uh, when you go to the 8.5 scenario. And this appears to be driven by partly by couplings to the sea ice extent. So when you get less and less sea ice, you also get a rap more rapid thawing of subsea permafrost. This is still being delved into the exact connections there. It probably has to do with brine formation of the sea ice that links to the, to the vulnerability of the subsea permafrost. Uh, but when the, where does this happen? As you see, most of these are maps that shows you from the left 2.6 of the 8.5, and you see that most of this thaw is affecting the Siberian shelf systems, where also a lot of this carbon is stored. Uh, and it's, it's not happening super rapidly, so if you go back, you see this really high thaw, we see around here 2100 and progressing to 2300. But still, uh, within, eight, within 100 years, you might see a very rapid thaw of these systems. Uh, and then if we take this one step further from compost thaw into model uh, degradation of organic carbon becoming available for, for microbes, you also see this quite high levels of organic carbon being degraded in the sediments themselves. And now I talked about that this is really difficult to actually transfer into emissions. So this is also for work in, in, in preparation in the Nunatari project that I mentioned before. Uh, but sort of early model results show us that uh, we might be looking at actual methane emissions if you account for the oxidation in the water column, how much you say in the water, what reaches the atmosphere, etc. Of anything between a few teragrams of methane per year in the sort of lower end scenarios up to something around 20, even 30 teragrams per year in the higher end scenarios. So then the subsidy purpose alone would actually out, outpace the total growth rate of methane that we're seeing right now globally, which is 17 terabytes. So that's a really concerning scale of magnitude. Um, but there are really large uncertainties. We, yeah, it's difficult to know how easy it is to decompose organic carbon. If methane production and consumption is very sensitive to the organic matter type, so we need to know the sediment types. How permeable is the sediment to gas? That is also something that is relatively poorly known, but very important for the modern output. And how effective is the methane oxidation of consumption in the sediment and the water column? These are remain really large uncertainties, which means that these numbers that I just showed should be taken you know, as indicative, but still early days. Uh, so then the question is, do we see any of this, you know, this, sort of, this methane already in the atmosphere right now? And the short answer to that is no, not yet. There is no strong evidence that subsea methane is really reaching the atmosphere in, in quantities large enough to be to be duly detected in global methane budgets. But we probably will in the future. Probably we surely will if if, if we're warming to slowly as they are right now. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That was uh, sort of my my end and my take home message with this talk.